Good evening. I'm Adam Goodhart, director of the CV Star Center, and thanks to all of you for coming to the last event in our 2012 series with Dr. Richard Beeman, Meet the Founders. Over the past several weeks, we have, at least uh, those of you who have um, attended these past talks, which I think is probably most of you, um, we have met some memorable personalities, the irascible, exuberant, perhaps indeed bipolar John Adams, the prodigiously creative Thomas Jefferson, the fiery Thomas Paine, the cerebral framer James Madison, and the populist dissident Patrick Henry. And now, as they say, I wish I had a fife and drum to give a drum roll, the man we have all been waiting for, the man who, at least around here, needs no introduction, George Washington. Um, our distinguished speaker, Dr. Richard Beeman, also needs little introduction for most of you who have attended his past talks here at Washington College, but as he brings this marvelous series to a close, I'd just like to say how honored we all are, um, not just those of us at the Star Center, but I think everyone who has enjoyed these talks, how honored we are um, by his association uh, with Washington College as a senior fellow of the Center. Um, and uh, also a uh, senior fellow of the uh, Institute for Religion, Politics, and Culture. Um, and also uh, grateful to him for coming down from Philadelphia and sharing his insights and expertise with us over these past few weeks. He's worked incidentally very hard in preparing these original lectures from scratch. He really, he makes it look so easy and so informal and conversational when he's, when he's up here, but um, he's worked uh, tremendously hard in, in plotting these lectures um, out, and they are original, original works, each one in a way an original, original essay. Um, and he's done all this, um, also he's made it look easy, but he's done all this at a moment when there happen to be many other demands on his time, including an imminently looming, in fact ever more imminently looming, book deadline. Um, Rick, we are truly, all of us, blessed by your generosity, um, by your friendship, and we hope to see you here again soon, although maybe not until after your book has been put to bed. So thank you so much. <laughs> now, this is the Star Center's last public program of 2012, so I'd also like to take a moment to do something that uh, I would like to do actually at every public program if, weren't, if it weren't for the fact that my introductions are so prolix already. Um, and that is to thank um, each one of my colleagues from the Star Center and from Washington College who worked so hard to make the past semester's programs a success. Michael Buckley, Lois Kitts, Jennifer Endicott, and our student associate Kathy Thornton, where Kathy, as usual, is lurking in the back of the room with a camera um, which uh, you'll often see her doing if she's not in the front lobby in a tricorn hat as she was at last week's book prize event. Um, but again, um, these are people who managed to make everything look so easy, but trust me, it's not. They've risen to many challenges this semester um, and uh, done a splendid job. So thanks to all of you. And thanks as well to those from beyond the Star Center at Washington College who also have just been tremendous supporters of these programs and worked very hard this semester, especially Larry Stahl, who's managed um, all of the uh, audio for these programs here in the Beeman series and many others, um, to Shannon Weibel, who has done our book sa sales with admirable aplomb, um, and uh, also to uh, Eric Broussard, who has um, done our uh, audiovisual recording so that you can find uh, many of these programs um, available online. Thanks to all of you. <laughs> so um, thanks to all of you, and you don't need to give yourselves a round of applause, but I will do it. Um, thanks to all of you for your wonderful support of our programs um, this year. And we do have another exciting semester coming all too soon, actually, um, in the new year. So stay tuned for that. If you're not already on our email list, you can sign up at the table outside. Um, and now, um, not just the man, but the men we have all been waiting for, Richard Beeman and George Washington. Thank you, Adam, and uh, uh, thank you to all the people whom Adam just 
a thank. I actually want to give a special thanks to Shannon Weibel from the Washington College Bookstore. You will notice that I am wearing uh, a Washington College Goose Nation tie, bow tie, <laughs> which Shannon gave to me last week. She really, you know, I, I, the bow tie is part of my uniform, so she wanted me to be appropriately attired tonight, so I, I thank her for that. Um, well, here we go, the, the last one. Uh, in my introduction to the f first of these three lectures, I confess that I would uh, only be able to introduce you to a few of the founders, and I confess that my choices uh, about the, uh, those founders to whom I would devote my remarks would be a highly subjective one, and I further admitted that I would only be able to focus on just a few important moments in the lives of those few founders who I chose to talk about. Well, as Adam's already said, I don't think I need to offer much of a defense of my choice of, of George Washington as the subject of my lecture this evening, not only because he is the individual after whom uh, this wonderful college has been named. Uh, I was just told by Larry that it is General Washington after whom he was named because it was founded in 1782 when Washington was still a, a, a general, but also because in almost every sense of the meaning of the phrase, I truly do believe uh, uh, that he was and is the father of our country. From the time of his service as commander of the Continental Army uh, to his role as president of the Constitutional Convention to his vitally important contribution as our nation's first president. I'll confess that for much of my own professional career, I've struggled with trying to figure out what it was that caused Americans to hold Washington in such high regard. Uh, he seemed to me, as I think to many Americans, more of a bronze or marble statue than a real living, thinking human being. Uh, a symbol, almost a figurehead of the events of our revolutionary era, but, uh, but, but who was he really? Uh, but in the past several years, as I have for the first time tried a little harder to figure out what was going on inside his head, um, I, 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 my regard for him has only increased uh, enormously. For, night, for tonight's talk, I've chosen to focus on the last phase of his career, the years of his two terms uh, of service as President of the United States. I was sorely tempted to give a different talk, a talk that, in fact, I have given uh, in other places before, a talk that focuses on his role as President of the Constitutional Convention, uh, it's a subject I know well, and it's near and dear uh, to my heart, and it is uh, a moment in Washington's life when he was at his very best. But I decided not to do that, and instead to spend this past week writing this talk, to talk about the years of his presidency, uh, uh, and to give uh, the talk the title, The Anguish of America's First President. Uh, and I did, uh, made that decision for three reasons. The first is that I do believe that his service as president established some standards and set some precedents that have endured in our nation from this time forward. The second is that I do believe that his years of service uh, as president may have been the most difficult of his life. And because of that, I think they t tend to reveal more of the inner Washington. Always a challenge uh, for historians uh, to uh, discern. Uh, and finally, if there is a single theme that, I, I've, that I've tried to use to link these three lectures together, it is that of the way in which our founders, in spite of their differences in personalities, temperaments, regional or economic interests, the ways in which they did manage to find what I've called common ground, in the effort first to achieve independence for the 13 colonies and uh, later to build a stable and cohesive nation. Um, there was no person more committed to finding that common ground, more self-consciously aware of his role as a person capable of transcending personal or partisan differences and representing all of we the people. No person. Uh, more dedicated uh, to that than George Washington. But at no time in his life was that job more difficult than during his terms as president. Before I begin discussing that presidency, though, let me take you back uh, 
to September 18, 1787, the day after the Constitutional Convention adjourned. On that day, as he was getting ready to leave Philadelphia to go back uh, to Mount Vernon, Washington wrote a hurried note to the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, a letter telling his dear friend and military compatriot the, that the final product of the convention, the proposed constitution was, and I quote, now a child of fortune to be fostered by some and buffeted by others. What will be the general opinion on or the reception of it is not for me to decide, nor shall I say anything for or against it. If it be good, I suppose it will work its way good. If bad, it will recoil on the framers. Soon after he wrote that letter, sometime in the afternoon of September 18th, Washington set off in his carriage uh, back home to Mount Vernon, desperately eager to get the heck out of Philadelphia. Uh, and he did so, as he did so, he knew that the debate over the Constitution was not over. And indeed, uh, that it had just begun. Uh, for, as I said last week in my talk about Patrick Henry and James Madison, for at that moment, the Constitution represented nothing more than opinion. The opinion of the 39 delegates who had signed it on September 17th, but it wouldn't be until we, the people of at least nine of 13 states, had agreed to ratify it uh, that it would become the law of the land. Washington knew that that debate was likely to be a heated and passionate one. And when he told Lafayette that he would say nothing either for or against it, he really meant it. From October of 1787 through the late summer of 1788, uh, the debate over ratification uh, raged on uh, with, a passionate out, uh, uh, with a positive outcome nowhere near certain. And though Washington did a little behind the scenes lobbying in his home state of, of Pennsylvania, uh, where he was being kept in touch with uh, things by Edmund Randolph and James Madison. Uh, for the most part, uh, he really avoided making any public comments about those events or getting involved in them. Some of his silence during that period was no doubt the result of a kind of political fatigue. He really did want to return to his real life at Mount Vernon. But certainly another reason for that silence was that Washington recognized that he, more than any other person in America, he needed to do everything he could to avoid becoming involved in the passionate debate between the Federalists and Anti-Federalists that was about to unfold, to stay above the partisan fray. That was what the father of one's country needed to do. And he was already being referred by people as the father of his country. By the late summer of 1788, however, as it became clear that the necessary nine of 13 states had agreed to the Constitution and that a new government would soon be organized, Washington must have known that his passive role in his nation's future was about to end. He knew that he was the obvious choice to be America's first chief executive. Indeed, he had known that from the moment that the framers of the Constitution began debating the creation of the executive office during the summer of 1787. Yet he seemed unwilling, indeed unable, to talk about it. Uh, in October of 1788, uh, a, a Richmond, Virginia merchant, Alexander Donald, visited Mount Vernon and, and reported that he, Washington, appears to be greatly against going into public life again. He pleads an excuse for himself, his love of retirement and his advanced age. And in a conversation with James Madison, uh, Washington explained his reticence about serving uh, by saying that he had from the beginning found himself deficient in many of the essential qualifications for the presidency, owing to my inexperience in the forms of public business, my unfitness to judge of legal questions, and questions arising out of the Constitution. Now, this was, let me say, vintage, self-deprecating uh, Washington. This is what he always said every time he was asked to do something uh, important. And, and perhaps, perhaps we can believe him uh, at, at this moment in his life. But from all over the country came pleas from Washington's colleagues to throw his hat in the ring. Uh, 
from Governor Morris in Philadelphia, uh, saying, and I quote, 13 horses now about to be coupled together. They will listen to your voice and submit to your control. You, therefore, must mount that seat. Uh, and from Alexander Hamilton, it is indispensable that you should lend yourself to the new government's first operations. Uh, should he fail to do so, Hamilton almost shouted, everything would be thrown into confusion. Uh, uh, one interesting thing that I've discovered in all of this is that Hamilton, interestingly, is perhaps the only man in America who seems uh, able or willing to talk to Washington almost as if he were his equal, uh, frankly, and, and even passionately. Franklin really lets it all hang out in his, both his conversations with Washington and his uh, correspondence with him. As America's first presidential election drew near, in spite of his objections to the contrary, it was apparent that Washington would allow his name to be put forward. Uh, although there were a few other plausible candidates, uh, John Adams and John Hancock of Massachusetts among them. Uh, but I honestly don't think anyone in the country imagined anyone other than Washington as their first president. The vote for presidential electors took place on January 7th, 1789, not in November, and the electors in each of the states were to send their votes to Congress on February 4th, 1789. The votes uh, would not be officially counted until the newly elected Congress convened, which was supposed to be on March 4th, 1789. But since the Congress took much longer to get its own act together, the electoral votes, in fact, were not counted until April uh, 6th. This first American national election, whether for Congress uh, or for the president, really was a kind of ragtag affair. The ratification process took a little bit longer than expected, uh, so they really had to hustle around uh, uh, to get things uh, done on time, which, which they did not do. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that during all of this extended period, Washington knew that he was going to be the first president of the United States. He probably could have set out for New York to get ready to assume his responsibilities as president before the official, uh, official vote count. But whether because he was still enjoying his time at Mount Vernon, or more likely because he wished to display the sense of propriety for which he was so uh, respected, he quietly stayed put at home. He stayed put at home until April 14th, 1789, when Charles Thompson, the secretary of the new federal Congress, appeared at his door at Mount Vernon and formally notified the general that he had received every one of the 69 votes cast by the electors in the nation's first presidential election. Washington was obviously prepared for that moment, for he responded to Thompson's news with what was not only a classically Washingtonian speech, but obviously a previously prepared speech. I think it's been mentioned that uh, uh, as a teacher, I've often done impersonations of some of the historical characters that I lecture about, Tom Paine and Davy Crockett and Jonathan Edwards and occasionally Thomas Jefferson, but I never have the nerve to do George Washington. I cannot do George Washington, but, but here is what George Washington said to uh, Charles Thompson uh, as he greeted him at the door. While I feel the arduous nature of the task which is conferred on me and feel my inability to perform it, I wish there may not be reason for regretting the choice. All I can promise is only that which can be accomplished by an honest zeal. A very poor impersonation of Washington. Uh, have al having already packed his bags and arranged for the management of Mount Vernon in his absence, he was clearly ready to go, he set out very quickly on his journey to the nation's temporary capital in New York City. As he made that journey, he was deeply touched by the thousands of people lining the roads all along his route, jostling just to get a glimpse of their hero and cheering him every mile of the way. It really was an extraordinary outpouring of affection, all the more touching because of its spontaneity. It wasn't organized by a political party. There were no advance you know, press releases. This all came about uh, through uh, word of mouth. It really is a again, a, a remarkable indication of 
just how much the people of America loved George Washington. He took his oath of office on April 29, 1789, before the members of both houses of the first federal Congress in the Senate chamber of Federal Hall in New York City. Although it is widely believed that he added the words, so help me God, to the oath prescribed by the Constitution, which does not have that phrase. In fact, the only evidence that he did so was reported in a newspaper report 65 years later. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, apparently no other president following Washington used the phrase, so help me God, until, and I'm looking at Adam here, I think George, uh, Abraham Lincoln may have done it in his second inaugural address, I believe. Uh, uh, but uh, so it, it, it's, a, it, it's certainly not a well-established fact that he added that phrase, but myth or no myth, for the latter part of the 19th century and most of the 20th and all of the 21st century, as far as I can tell, I think the only 20th century president who did not add, so help me God, to the oath was Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, but most presidents have added that phrase to their oaths of office, citing Washington as their president. And nowhere was it written that the incoming president would deliver an inaugural address. But Washington, in the first of what would be dozens of precedents set during his time in office, Washington chose to do so. Once again, humility and self-deprecation uh, were the main themes. No event, he began, could have filled me with greater anxiety than the awesome responsibility of serving as the nation's first president. Uh, but, he added, he was honored to accept the post in spite of his inferior endowments and inexperience in the duties of civil administration. As was the case when Washington accepted the position as commander of the Continental Army and then ended up spending eight grueling years in that job, it's pretty clear that when he accepted the presidency uh, that he had no intention of spending eight long years as president. A at one point, uh, in fact, he told Thomas Jefferson that he expected to serve only two years of his first four-year term, after which, hopefully, he said all would be well in motion and he could simply step down. He did not take seriously the, the four-year term as president. As historian Bernard Balin uh, uh, has written, the Constitution amounted to no more than words on paper until President George Washington and the first Federal Congress began to implement the theoretical principles enunciated in that document. No one was more aware of the truth of that statement than Washington himself. In all of his writings and his actions, he was acutely aware that virtually every action he took as the nation's first uh, chief executive would be critically important in adding substance to the bare superstructure created by the Constitution, and that those actions would serve as precedents for subsequent generations. Over the course of the next years, Washington would establish the legitimacy not only of the American presidency, but also of the American state. This may seem like a pretty obvious statement, but it's important to remember the context in which Washington accomplished uh, those goals. He was the president of a country which had an immense fear of excessive governmental power particularly of the power of a central government located afar from the people. And with the history of the events of the revolution in mind, Americans had a particular fear of excessive executive power. Yet Washington managed, at least in his first four years in office, to build and legitimize the power of both the government and the executive branch uh, of, of that government in ways that few could have expected. He did not do this alone. He relied heavily on the advice and counsel of other members of his presidential cabinet, and in particular on the advice and counsel of his Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, I would note in this regard that the very existence of a presidential cab cabinet is only hinted at in the Constitution. Uh, Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution uh, gives the president to appoint with the consent of the Senate, and I quote, ambassadors, other public ministers, councils, judges of the Supreme Court, 
and all other officers of the United States. But it is silent on what those other officers of the United States might be. The Congress began steps to create three departments during its first months of operation, a Department of Foreign Affairs, later to become the Department of State, whose first secretary would be Thomas Jefferson, a Department of War, later to be the Department of Defense, whose uh, uh, first head was Washington's Revolutionary War buddy, Henry Knox, and most important of all, a Department of the Treasury uh, headed up by Alexander Hamilton. More than anyone else in the Washington administration, Hamilton would not only transform the very nature of a cabinet secretary from a minor informal advisor to that of a critically important agency uh, responsible uh, for developing uh, a public uh, policy. Uh, you know, it is amazing to me if we look today at the humble beginnings uh, of, of George Washington's cabinet and you travel to Washington today and see these vast buildings <laughs> which house the thousands of employees of each cabinet secretary, you do get a, a very stark physical <laughs> demonstration of just uh, how uh, much our federal government has expanded for better uh, or for, for worse. Uh, and all of those people in all of those agencies uh, are there as part of the president's job to execute the laws. To, 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 we, we have created this huge administrative state uh, uh, as, as part of the uh, executive uh, branch. Hamilton would formulate a series of policy proposals that would expand in significant ways the power of the central government. But at the same time, he would set off a debate on the constitutional limits of both executive and congressional power that lasts to the present day. Uh, and now I really do get into the, the heart of this uh, talk. During the years 1790 to 91, Hamilton put forward ambitious proposals to put the young nation's finances on a sound footing. He proposed not only that the new government pay off all of the debts incurred by the continental government during the Revolutionary War, but also to assume the debts of the individual state governments. He hoped to establish the precedent that the federal government, not the individual states, the federal government was responsible for overseeing the financial well-being of the nation's economy. There was heated opposition to Hamilton's plan, including opposition from two of Washington's closest friends and supporters, Jefferson and Madison, who argued that his proposal to pay off the state debts amounted to a usurpation of state power. But Congress passed the bill and Washington signed it into law. Even more significantly, in 1791, Hamilton proposed the creation of a bank, of a national bank, the Bank of the United States. That bank was designed to operate as a private, profit-making corporation, but it was also designed to function as a public entity with the authority to handle many of the federal government's financial policies and transactions. Congress passed that act and then submitted it to Washington for his signature. Mindful that many in the Congress, and in particular many in his home state, believed that Hamilton's bank bill was in no way authorized by the Constitution. Read the Constitution. Where in the Constitution does it say that the federal government has the power to essentially give a monopoly to a bank and then hand over to that bank all of the government's business? Uh, uh, some, I might add, would also ask the same the question. I'm, I'm not, this is not an argument against the Federal Reserve Bank, <laughs> but, but you could ask the same question about our Federal Reserve System. Where in the Constitution does it say that Congress has the power to, uh, uh, to create a Federal Reserve System which uh, is responsible for the monetary policy of our nation? Uh, so this is a, a real question that Washington is confronted with. He asked his Secretary of the Treasury, Hamilton, and his Secretary of the State, Jefferson, to offer their opinions on the constitutionality of the bill. Jefferson, seconded by his friend and colleague, uh, James Madison, objected on two grounds, namely that nowhere in the Constitution did it say that the Congress had the power to pass such legislation, uh, and, and second, 
uh, that Hamilton's a bank bill violated the terms of the Tenth Amendment, which, of course, specifically reserved all powers not specifically dele delegated to Congress to the states. And Jefferson then laid down uh, the doctrine that has come to be known as the doctrine of the strict construction of the Constitution, uh, namely that the final paragraph of Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, uh, which gives to Congress the power to pass laws necessary and proper for carrying into effect the specifically enumerated powers of Congress, those enumerated powers being power of taxation, power to regulate commerce, power to coin money, uh, et cetera, that that clause, the so-called necessary and proper clause, needed to be interpreted narrowly. In other words, that, that, that any law uh, passed and justified by the necessary and proper clause would have to be seen as indispensable to carrying out those other specifically enumerated powers. So that's the doctrine of, of strict construction. I will say, by the way, this is shameful of me, but my penguin guided the Constitution out there, <laughs> which does go through each clause of the Constitution. It does If you've forgotten what I just said, <laughs> it does sort of lay out you know, the, the meaning of these various uh, clauses. In any case, Hamilton responded with his broad constructionist argument, uh, saying that if a law was useful or conducive to carrying into effect the specifically enumerated powers, then the implied powers embedded in the Constitution would justify the enactment of such legislation. So we have the strict constructionist argument from Jefferson and Madison and the broad constructionist argument from Hamilton. President Washington, after listening to the two arguments, sided with Hamilton and signed the bill into law it would prove to be an epical decision. For not only would it allow the federal government to greatly expand its powers, but it would also stimulate an argument, that between strict constructionists and broad constructionists, that would reverberate through the ages. John Marshall, in his important Supreme Court decisions in the early 19th century, among them a decision upholding the constitutionality of the Bank of the United States, uh, John Marshall would embrace Hamilton's argument. And indeed, in the politics of our own age, the Democratic Party, by and large, embraces Hamilton's strict constructionist doctrine, uh, and the Republican Party invokes a Jefferson, I'm sorry, uh, embraces Hamilton's broad constructionist doctrine with the Republican Party invoking Jefferson's strict constructionist doctrine. While I absolutely am not claiming, I've got to make this clear, that Washington's embracing of Hamilton's broad constructionist argument uh, would have made Washington a supporter of the constitutionality of Obamacare. <laughs> uh, and, and I actually, I mean, I truly do believe that it is uh, 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 not only impossible, but foolish to try to, you know, uh, jet George Washington into the 21st century and, and have him, you know, offer his constitutional opinion on whether it's the health care law or child pornography on the internet or uh, you name it. It, it just, uh, the original intent of the framers uh, on our current issues is just too difficult uh, uh, to discern. So I'm really not saying that Washington uh, would have been on the, uh, on Justice Roberts' majority side in the Obamacare decision. But it is the case that the constitutional divide between the supporters and opponents of the health care law is one of the many, even hundreds of echoes of the arguments between those two sides that has come down to us through the ages, ever since Washington made the decision to endorse Hamilton's point of view. It really was a very important decision. Hamilton is quoted famously as saying, I've been much indebted to the kindness of the general, and he was an aegis very essential to me. Uh, that word aegis is roughly translated from the Greek as shield, and many historians have interpreted that statement that, to mean that Hamilton was the, the real person in the Washington administration with all the brain power, indeed with all the power, uh, with Washington sometimes unwittingly 
uh, serving as, as Hamilton's protector. Uh, it is certainly true that Hamilton knew much more uh, about the intricacies of the world of finance uh, than his, his boss Washington did. It's also true that the only two people who could come even close to Hamilton in the clarity of their constitutional arguments uh, were Hamilton's two opponents, Jefferson and, and Madison. But what Washington possessed more than Hamilton, Madison, or Jefferson was judgment. He read the opposing arguments, and most important, he thought pragmatically rather than legalistically about the economic needs of the nation and decided that Hamilton's defense of the bank, like his defense of the assumption of the state debts, made the most economic sense for the well-being of the nation at that time. The really important point to stress here is that both Washington and Hamilton, from the time their service in the Continental Army uh, first began, those two had always thought about America's future from a continental rather than a provincial point of view. And it was that shared continental vision uh, that made Hamilton and Washington such close allies uh, during uh, this uh, period often to the consternation of, 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 of Jefferson, who saw Hamilton gaining the upper hand. Madison and Jefferson did not share that vision. And increasingly, Washington would find himself in, contact with, in, in conflict with those two Virginians, two men whom he genuinely liked and respected. At the beginning, neither Jefferson nor Madison publicly criticized Washington. But it was clear from their behaviors that Washington's anguish as president was about to begin. Jefferson, who was serving as Washington's Secretary of State, kept quiet for the moment. But Madison, serving in the Congress, began to take the lead in organizing opposition to Washington's policies in a way that would not only change his relationship with Washington, but would also utterly transform the way our nation's political system has operated from that time forward. Motivated by his opposition to Washington's and Hamilton's broad constructionist policies, Madison would take the lead in the organization of something wholly unanticipated, wholly undesired by the founding fathers. He would begin to create our modern party system. Although initially composed of loosely formed coalitions of men in Congress, uh, uh, those coalitions were gradually transformed into self-conscious entities founded on a large popular base throughout the country as a whole, whose whole job was to mobilize the people to elect supporters of their point of view to the control of the Congress and the control of the executive branch. The formation of the Federalist and Republican parties, that Republican party, because Republican is a word used in so many different contexts. The Republican Party, that's what they called themselves. So in some places, they were called the Democratic Republicans. In some places, they were called the Jeffersonian uh, Republicans, but they were basically the party of Madison and, and Jefferson. Uh, those parties would not only transform the very character of America's political dialogue, but they would hugely increase the anguish felt by President George Washington. Make no mistake about it, George Washington was an old-fashioned politician. All of his life, he had tried to transcend partisanship. He truly did think of himself, not egotistically, as the father of his country, the one person in the country uh, who could, by his example, lead Americans uh, into political behavior that valued individual and public virtue and service to the public good, uh, not into special interests. The emergence of the party system and the partisan rhetoric that accompanied its growth was deeply painful to Washington. Painful both in that he deeply disapproved of the tone of the political dialogue uh, occurring across the country, but painful also in an acutely uh, personal sense. It became increasingly difficult to avoid concluding that the attacks on his administration uh, uh, were also attacks on him. It was in this context that Washington agonized 
over whether to run for a second term in office. He truly did not want to serve another term. But at the same time, a combination of pride and duty suggested to him that he must do so. He believed, mistakenly, as things would turn out, he believed that his continued presence in the chief executive's mansion, uh, uh, that his presence in the mansion would quietly would quiet the increasing storm of partisanship uh, uh, around him. I, I should note here, I've forgotten to fill in a little detail, that Washington, of course, was inaugurated as president in the temp temporary capital of New York City uh, in, in, in Federal Hall, uh, uh, but in the fall of 1790, the government moved its operations to Philadelphia. Washington took up residence in the home uh, of Robert Morris, the same home in which he had stayed during the Constitutional Convention of 1787. Uh, and from the fall of 1790 uh, until John Adams moved into the White House in Washington, D.C., at the very, very end of his term, Robert Morris's home on the corner of 6th and Market Street in, in Philadelphia would be uh, America's uh, executive uh, mansion. It wasn't the White House because it was made out of brick. Uh, uh, Washington did believe that his presence in the executive mansion could quiet the a storm of partisanship around him. And of course, there was no shortage of others who were urging him to serve again as well. The most interesting of those, in my view, uh, was a woman who had been such an important part of Washington's life uh, during uh, the Constitutional uh, uh, Convention. Uh, and, and I need to give you a little bit of, of background here. There's a significant piece of my book Plain Honest Men, in which I introduce the remarkably intelligent and vivacious Elizabeth Powell uh, to the reader. Uh, uh, Washington did not want to spend his summer in Philadelphia. He was a country boy, not a city boy. Uh, Washington was invited out to dinner virtually every uh, evening of his four months in Philadelphia. Uh, but there was no, uh, 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 no people with whom he spent more time uh, than uh, uh, the wealthy uh, Philadelphia merchant Samuel Powell uh, and his uh, wife Elizabeth. Uh, but believe me, it wasn't Samuel Powell who Washington was interested in spending time with. And as the summer uh, went on, uh, Washington, desperate to get out of this, the city, the Constitutional Convention would adjourn usually about 3 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and it's summertime. Uh, so uh, he and Elizabeth would get in a carriage and ride out into the countryside, just the two of them uh, uh, together. He really did develop uh, what I call in the book uh, a genuinely intimate relationship uh, with Elizabeth. I also make a point of saying it was, I believe it was a chaste relationship. Uh, but it really uh, was a relationship which uh, gives me a little more insight in, into the inner Washington. He genuinely enjoyed uh, her, her company. Uh, in any case, once the nation's capital had moved back to Philadelphia, both George and Martha Washington, of course, Martha wasn't in Philadelphia summer of 1787. She was back at Mount Vernon. But both George and Martha uh, had moved to Philadelphia, and they moved back into the social circle of Elizabeth and her husband, Samuel Powell. Although, as always, it was Elizabeth who was the featured attraction in that relationship. Sometime in the fall of 1792, Washington confessed to Elizabeth that he was considering stepping down from the presidency after his first term. Uh, upon hearing this news, Elizabeth took the extraordinary step uh, for a woman of this 18th century era, women who were not supposed to talk about politics, uh, uh, of writing Washington in boldly political language. Your resignation, she wrote, would elate the enemies of good government. They would say that you were actuated by principles of self-love alone, that you saw the post was not tenable with any prospect of adding to your fame. Your opponents would use it as an argument for dissolving the union and would urge that you, from experience, had found the present system a bad one and had artfully withdrawn from it uh, so that you might not be crushed under its ruin. She really lit into it. She then went on to list the reasons why Washington and Washington alone had all of the abilities and integrity necessary for the job. You are, she insisted, the only man in America 
that dares to do right on all public occasions. You are the only man who refuses to be intoxicated by power or misled by flattery. And most important in Elizabeth's view was Washington's legendary self-control. You have, she wrote, demonstrated that you possess an empire over yourself. Uh, and, and I don't know why, but, but that phrase, more than any other uh, contemporary description of Washington, helps me understand the, Washington, the way Washington behaves, uh, a, at least in public. Uh, the job of building an empire doesn't happen spontaneously. You really have to work at it. Uh, and Washington, I think, very self-consciously had to work to build this remarkable sense of self-control uh, that he displayed whenever he was uh, in, in public. So I think Elizabeth hit the nail right uh, on the head. Although perhaps a little unfair to Washington's critics, uh, her assessment really was, I think, a remarkably uh, accurate one. And Washington, albeit reluctantly, did agree to run for that second term, an election in which he was once again unanimously selected by the presidential electors. But truly, the second term would be much more trying than the first. Uh, during his second term, the arguments between the two parties expanded into the area of foreign policy. And in agreeing to a necessary but highly controversial commercial treaty negotiated by Washington's new favorite diplomat, John Jay, uh, a treaty with America's former enemy, a Great Britain, the Washington administration came under even more direct attack, particularly from Washington's former Secretary of State. Jefferson had stepped down as Secretary of State. Uh, Jefferson felt that Washington's and Hamilton's tilt toward Great Britain, rather than uh, toward America's Revolutionary War ally, France, that that amounted to a form of apostasy. And now it was not only the Washington administration that came under direct attack, but Washington himself. During the debate over what came to be called the Jay Treaty, the Jeffersonian Republican press accused Washington of being a monarchist, of being a weakling intimidated by the British. They even began to question publicly for the first time the quality of his generalship during the Revolutionary War. Tom Paine actually wrote a pamphlet uh, denouncing Washington's lousy generalship uh, during uh, the war. Even more painful, in the aftermath of the controversial and closely contested ratification of the Jay Treaty by the United States Senate, Thomas Jefferson had written uh, a letter to an Italian friend of his, uh, Philip Mazzai, complaining that America's Republican Revolution was in danger, and then that a monarchical party had, and I quote, sprung up whose avowed object is to draw over us the substance as they have already done the form of the British government. He then went on to say, and I quote, that it would be, uh, that it would give you fever were I to name to you the apostate who has gone over to these heresies, the man who has had his head shaved by the harlot England. Matt's eye, without Jefferson's permission, and to Jefferson's horror, had the letter printed in an Italian newspaper and it quickly made its way across the Atlantic and was printed in nearly every newspaper in America. While Jefferson did not mention Washington's name, there was no doubt in anyone's mind that that apostate who had had his head shaved by the harlot England was none other than George Washington. This was so upsetting to Washington and indeed to Martha. Uh, Martha wrote to a friend uh, 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 telling uh, her friend that she considered Jefferson, one of the most detestable men of all of mankind. Uh, uh, Washington himself never confronted Jefferson, uh, but their uh, relationship cooled to the point of freezing. In fact, Washington's accomplishments in office were enormous. He had created the institution of the presidential cabinet and built the essential infrastructure of the executive branch. He established important presidents with respect to the relationship between Congress uh, and the executive branch, helping to define the separation of powers between those branches that had only been vaguely sketched out in the Constitution. 
With Hamilton's help, he had restored America's credit, both at home and abroad. And in agreeing to the necessary but highly controversial treaty with Great Britain, a treaty I think which most historians uh, would uh, now agree was uh, not very palatable but necessary, he took the initial but often difficult step of building respect for America on the world stage. But his mood at it, as his second term was coming to an end was marked more by feelings of torment than of triumph. Many of his friends comment on how much he had aged and on the anxiety visible in his countenance. Although his Federalist colleagues urged him to serve another term, and you know, age permitting, Washington could have served as president just as long as he wanted. There were no term limits, obviously, at, at, at that time, and, and he, he truly would have uh, been elected again and again. But he would hear none of it. He felt more urgently than ever that ease and retirement were indispensably necessary to him. As he contemplated his departure from the presidency on his final ride back to Mount Vernon, Washington felt compelled to prepare some sort of uh, what he called a valedictory address, a statement to the people of America not aimed not only at vindicating his eight years of office, in fact, he did very little of that in this address, but more important at articulating his hopes and fears for the country uh, in the years and decades to come. His farewell address began, that's what it was called, it's Washington's famous farewell address, began with his customary humility, with expressions of his inadequacy to the task that he'd been called to perform, and gratitude to the people who had placed uh, their trust in him. Truly, if one looks at every speech given by Washington from, from the time he accepted his post as commander of the Continental Army, down to this, his really last uh, public expression. They're all virtually identical in their tone of self-deprecation. That was his, uh, his uh, rhetorical mode. But in his farewell address, Washington then, uh, then abandoned humility after that preface as a rhetorical tool. Here then, he wrote, and I do need to say, the farewell address was actually never delivered as a speech. Uh, 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 there was no venue for him to deliver a speech to the nation. So he wrote it, and then, and then it was published in virtually all the newspapers across uh, the country. Uh, here then, he wrote, perhaps I should stop. But a solicitude for your welfare, which cannot end but with my life, and the apprehension of danger, urge me to offer to you, uh, to your solemn contemplation, some sentiments which appear to me all important to the permanency of your felicity as a people. The advice that he then delivered to the American people was shaped in some measure by the most urgent subject on his mind, the treacherous waters of foreign affairs, particularly the balance of power struggle going on between France and Spain on the one hand and Great Britain uh, on the other. Uh, his second term really had been consumed by the difficulties of finding an independent path for America caught between uh, those balance of power struggles between those European uh, nations. Uh, the best remembered part of Washington's farewell uh, uh, address speaks to that uh, uh, concern, uh, speaks uh, of the need to avoid uh, entangling alliances, uh, to avoid connecting ourselves with the politics of any nation, uh, and the importance of uh, fashioning America's relationship with Europe uh, based on a clear-headed calculation of its own uh, national interest. But embedded in the farewell address was another, was another more important message as well. The duty of all Americans to work diligently to hold their still fragile union together. Washington had watched anguished as Americans succumbed to a party spirit, pitting supporters of France against supporters of Great Britain, Southerners against Northerners, Easterners against Westerners, and of course, Federalists against Jeffersonian Republicans. The true salvation of America's experiment in Republicanism, Washington believed, lay in the Union itself. The American government was, Washington wrote, the offspring of our own choice, 
adopted upon full investigation and mature deliberation, completely free in its principles, in the distribution of its powers, uniting security with energy, and containing within itself a provision for amendment. It has a just claim to your confidence and support. Washington's farewell was more an expression of hope than of certainty. During their final years of his presidency, he had, he had endured bitter attacks from an increasingly well-organized Republican Party. He'd been attacked viciously by opponents of a treaty which he truly believed was in the nation's best interests. And even his former friends and allies, Jefferson and Madison, had been behind some of those attacks. As he began his retirement, he turned once again to his dear friend and companion during the summer of 1787, Elizabeth Powell, for consolation. Uh, in a message to Elizabeth, which interestingly, uh, he wrote to Martha, because Washington was back at Mount Vernon for, at the time, <laughs> in, a, in, in a message to Washington, but worrying about propriety, <laughs> having, maybe having David Petraeus and who knows else in mind. <laughs> She wrote the, the, the letter to, uh, to, to Martha and then asked her to deliver the message to Washington. <laughs> uh, 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 Washington uh, predicted, in any way, I'm sorry, in his letter to, uh, to, to, to Elizabeth, he predicted the attacks on him might well continue long after he had departed from the earth. I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Washington wrote Elizabeth, but he had Martha submit the letter to Elizabeth so that there was no sense of impropriety on his part. Uh, his only hope, he joked, was that he could outlive his enemies. He vowed to do everything he could to live into the next century in order to get the better of his adversaries. But of course, he fell just short of that goal. In the late evening of December 14, 1789, he succumbed to a bacterial infection and passed quietly from the world a world in which the political environment in his country was anything but quiet. In the year following his death, the American Republic would witness more turmoil, more nasty political rhetoric than, any, than at any time in its previous history, and indeed that at any time until the eve of the American Civil War. The election of 1800 would be one of the nastiest in all of American history. And here's just a brief sample. Here's the Federalist Press on Thomas Jefferson. A vote for Jefferson is a vote against God. If he is elected president, the people of this nation will receive the just vengeance of insulted heaven. We will witness our dwellings in flames, hoary hairs bathed in blood, female chastity violated, and children writhing on the pike and halberd. And here's the pro-Jefferson press on John Adams. I love this one. He is a blind, bald, crippled, toothless man. <laughs> a hideous, hermaphroditical character with neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. <laughs> How had it come to this? Was all of this tumult and partisan rancor proof of a fear that Washington had expressed many years before during the darkest days of the Confederation government, uh, when he expressed the fear that the people, when left to themselves, were not fit to determine their own government? The election campaign of 1800, one of the most repulsive in all of American history, would undermine the faith of supporters of both political parties. Uh, in the future of their democratic polity. Their faith in the ability of the candidates on either side to represent all of we the people. Indeed, had Washington been alive to witness that election, his anguish about America's future would have only increased. Fortunately for our nation, Thomas Jefferson, after he had finally emerged victorious in that bitterly disputed election, an election which took months and months to decide and 30-some votes in the House of Representatives before he uh, finally uh, uh, was officially elected, 
But Thomas Jefferson ultimately rose to the occasion, realizing that it was time to heal, to heal the wounds of the previous highly partisan years. In his inaugural address delivered on March 4, 1801, Jefferson reminded the American people that every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. We have called by different names brethren of the same principle. We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. And he concluded his speech by asking his fellow Americans to pursue with courage and confidence our own federal and Republican principles and to retain uh, their faith in America's future as the happiest and most prosperous place in the world. And indeed, Jefferson's subsequent actions reinforced the wisdom of his words. During his presidency, dwellings were not wrapped in flames, hoary hairs were not bathed in blood, children did not writhe on the pike and halberd, and female chastity, well, it wasn't violated any more than had been the case in the past. <laughs> America's future was indeed bright, and had Washington lived to the end of Jefferson's two terms of office, his fears about the future of the American public would, I think, have been fully dispelled and his hopes fully restored. Moreover, he would, I think, have found considerable satisfaction in the knowledge that he, more than any person in America, had been responsible for laying the foundation that would assure that the American future would be a bright one. We already talked about this uh, uh, last Tuesday. I realize that uh, there are in this room different opinions about the outcome of our recent and incredibly nasty and depressive and repulsive presidential campaign. But I do hope that we can all retain our sense of optimism about the fundamental aspects of American society, an optimism that our future is indeed a bright one. Thank you very much for listening to me. <clears throat> And as, as usual, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if, uh, if you have any. Don't feel you need to, but yes, sir. Why Washington never did what? Um, the question was, we know that John Adams always thought that the office of the vice presidency was a useless job, uh, and do we know why Washington did not turn uh, much to Adams? Uh, well, uh, on the one hand, Adams did regard the vice presidency as a useless job. He said that many times. But had he not been elected vice president, he would have been really ticked off. He certainly did want to be known as the second most popular person in America. And at that time, you know, each elector cast two electoral votes, and the one receiving the most electoral votes was president, the second most uh, vice president. Adams was way behind Washington, and he, uh, he, he, uh, uh, he talked about the scurrilous manner in which he was uh, uh, elected. Uh, uh, but... Uh, uh, I, I, that's a, you know, that's a good question. Uh, I think Adams performed, Adams tried to perform his duty as president of the Senate, president pro tem of the Senate. Uh, and, you know, there's this famous anecdote about uh, Adams in the Senate uh, and that there's this debate about what should you call the president. And, and they ultimately decide to call the president his excellency, but usually they, now we call him Mr. President. If you're Mitch McConnell, you'd call him something much nastier than that, actually. But anyway, um, <laughs> and uh, but Adams, you know, wants no. That's not dignified enough, you know. And uh, we don't want His Majesty, but it's got to be something really, you know, fancy. Uh, and so the members of the Senate, of course, started calling Adams his rotundity. <laughs> but uh, so uh, I think Adams actually took some pride in his uh, service as vice president, and he did indeed regard it as a stepping stone to the presidency. Yes. 
So I, I don't know if you all heard the question. If General Washington were here in Chestertown, would he be a Republican or a Democrat or say a pox uh, on, on, on both your houses? It's a, 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 as I said, I'm very reluctant to try to you know, jet set him back uh, 225 years, 200 and from more than that. Um, he did have a continental vision. Uh, he did not believe in a weak central government. He did believe in a government with energy. After all, I mean, this was the commander of the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War. Every single time a, a state failed to come up uh, with the appropriate money uh, to furnish him with more troops or more supplies, he paid the price. Uh, and so he was absolutely a supporter of a very strong central government under the Constitution. But so was James Madison. And James Madison ended up moving uh, uh, to, to the other side. Uh, uh, I think more than anything else, I will say this, actually. I think more than anything else, Washington would be among those today, whether he was a Republican or a Democrat, begging the American people to move to the Senate uh, and, and to stop all of the partisanship on either uh, extreme of, uh, of the party. I, I, I was driving down to Washington uh, yesterday, and my NPR station from Philadelphia faded out, so I ended up uh, uh, listening to um, C-SPAN radio in Washington, D.C., which I don't, we don't get in Philadelphia. And the first thing I heard, which almost made me run off the road, actually, uh, was this speech by uh, Senator McConnell. Uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry about this, but I gotta let it all hang out here. It wasn't so much that you know, he opposed uh, uh, the Democratic Party's uh, pro, you know, way of avoiding the financial cliff but the incredibly disrespectful way in which he kept speaking about the president. And you need to do this, and you have failed to lead in your first term, and why do you think you can lead in your second term? It was a, it, that would have broken Washington's heart, I think, to hear that level of disrespect uh, from a, a, a member of Congress to the president. And then I heard uh, 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 Senator Rob Portman from Ohio he was at a Wall Street Journal CEO conference, but he was sort of diagnosing the Republican defeat. And there I heard a centrist Republican who really was thinking open-mindedly about how to you know, get us off the fiscal financial cliff. So I think Washington, if he'd been in the car with me yesterday, would have preferred Rob Portman to Mitch McConnell. <laughs> yes? What was so objectionable to Thomas Paine Well, uh, Jefferson and Paine were Anglophobes. They, hate, they never forgave Great Britain from what they did to Americans to uh, lead them into revolution. You read Jefferson's list of specific grievances in the Declaration of Independence, they're pretty nasty. Um, and that's pretty much the same with Tom Paine. And of course, Tom Paine was not only uh, the, one of the leaders rhetorically of the movement for independence from Great Britain, but he also then became a, a, a leader uh, of, of the support for revolutionary France. So uh, Jefferson and Paine thought that America was betraying its revolutionary principles by allying itself with a monarchical government and turning its back on a, quote, Republican government. Now, Jefferson made some pretty serious errors as Secretary of State, because as the French Revolution gets more and more violent and they start chopping people's heads off, uh, uh, Jefferson keeps supporting, uh, you know, whichever uh, faction was in power in France, maybe a little bit longer than he should, which is one of the reasons why he resigned as Secretary uh, of State. Yes? Yes, the late 
a very interesting question. So to just briefly summarize the question, uh, how much was the success of the Washington administration due to Hamilton uh, or to Washington or to some partnership uh, between the two? Can I think of any person who had Hamilton's combination of financial astuteness and kind of political energy and uh, the trust of Washington? I can't. Robert Morris of Philadelphia, America's first big time financier, had at least as much uh, financial uh, uh, knowledge as Hamilton, but uh, Morris was in debtor's prison <laughs> during Washington's presidency, so that wouldn't uh, have worked. Um, I do think you know, those what ifs in history are always interesting. I do think it was a partnership. Uh, I absolutely don't think that Hamilton was manipulating Washington. I mean, I really do think that Washington was ultimately less concerned about the abstractions of strict constructionism versus broad constructionism, although that became the, our constitutional divide in this country from that time forward. I think he really was more interested pragmatically in is this bank gonna do uh, uh, some good for the country? Uh, and, and so again, I think I guess my answer is, is that it is a partnership. And, and although uh, maybe some of you have heard me say this, Hamilton was a completely worthless member of the Constitutional Convention because he had this very right-wing argument that we should imitate the British Constitution and appoint a president for life and so on and so forth. Uh, but as Secretary of the Treasury, he really did make a very significant contribution. One last question, yes sir. You know, unfortunately, I cannot, but maybe you could. <laughs> because I'm not a Marylander. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you a follow-up question, which is, I understand that Tillman graduated from Penn, and I wondered if he was one of your students. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was. Now I remember, yes. <laughs> well, thank you very much on that note.